so much for that. Uh, thank all of our witnesses for being here, Mr. Flake as well. Uh, before we get started, I do just want to mention that we have a, a particular guest with us here this morning, uh, Representative Carol Maloney, who does an incredible amount of work on human rights, uh, particularly in this uh, South Asia area of the world, uh, has a guest in town, and that is Dr. Sima Samar. Am I saying that properly? I just want to introduce her and thank her for her attendance. Uh, she is um, working hard to guarantee the equality for Afghan women throughout Afghanistan and uh, doing quite a bit of work on that on the Afghan Independent Human Rights Commission. So thank you for your work and thank you for joining us here this morning. We have a quorum present, and so we're going to uh, begin our hearing, which is entitled Troops, Diplomats, and Aid, Assessing Strategic Resources for Afghanistan. The meeting will come to order and ask unanimous consent that only the chairman and ranking member of the subcommittee be allowed to make opening uh, statements without objection so ordered. And I ask unanimous consent that the hearing record be kept open for five business days so that all members of the subcommittee may be allowed to submit a written statement for the record without objection so ordered. This morning, we're continuing what has been somewhat of a sustained oversight uh, on uh, this committee with regard to Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, we all understand that the challenges that we face in South Asia are breathtakingly complex. Oversight of U.S. programs, deployments, and spending requires an appreciation of the underlying ethnic tensions, historical grievances, and regional dynamics. The lines of conflict and the aspirations of the people have unique characteristics that call for serious consideration by U.S. policymakers charged with achieving United States national security interest. Problems this complex require that we use both a microscope and a telescope. As such, the subcommittee has spent significant time during this open, opening congressional work period to examine and investigate Afghanistan and Pakistan through a variety of different lenses. I know Mr. Cullen has uh, noted that uh, we don't have the usual nine months that it takes for a president to transition into office and get his key people in place. And consequently, uh, just as the president is moving quickly on this, Congress has to get itself in a position to react uh, to whatever proposals the administration may make. Two weeks ago, we held a public hearing featuring a panel of experts explaining the nature of the threats emanating from Afghanistan and Pakistan. Last week, we followed up with a classified briefing conducted by the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. Next Tuesday, we'll hold a hearing entitled Afghanistan and Pakistan, Understanding and Engaging Regional Stakeholders that will explore those countries through the lens of geopolitics in regional tensions and opportunities. Today, we turn our attention to the kind of footprint the United States should have in Afghanistan. How many troops? How many diplomats? How many aid workers? These questions, all of which involve deployment of United States citizens to a war zone, weigh heavily on those of us with the responsibility of public service. But at their core, these questions should be preceded by one fundamental question, what are we trying to achieve in Afghanistan? We hold this hearing as the administration prepares to release its Afghanistan and Pakistan strategic review. Ranking Member Flake and I have been in communication with the administration to ensure that the subcommittee receives a full briefing once this review is finalized. While the particulars of the administration's strategic review are still being sorted out, we do know some things. For instance, President Obama has already authorized the deployment of an additional 17,000 troops to Afghanistan. The nature of any recommendations for increased deployments of military or civilian personnel beyond this remains a subject of great speculation and debate, although reports have leaked that the President Obama is planning some kind of civilian surge as well. Other leaks indicate that the administration's new plan will aim to significantly boost Afghan army and police forces and to expand covert warfare, including airstrikes in western Pakistan. Before we get too far ahead of ourselves, let's return to a moment for what uh, is the most fundamental of questions, what do we seek to achieve in Afghanistan? One of our recent witnesses described in our, uh, that our effort in Afghanistan should be a counter-sanctuary objective, and I know some of our witnesses here today will address that. Under that approach, we would need to prevent al-Qaeda or like-minded international terrorists from establishing a safe haven from which they can plan and execute attacks against U.S. citizens at home or abroad. Putting aside the fact that al-Qaeda appears to have established a safe haven in western Pakistan, or has or could likely do so in any number of other places in the world, and that 9-11 was largely planned in Hamburg and Miami, it strikes me that a counter-sanctuary strategy differs greatly from a counterinsurgency strategy. Eliminating sanctuaries requires a fairly small military or covert footprint that is focused on disruption and containment, whereas counterinsurgency would require huge amounts of personnel and resources to ensure security and to support indigenous efforts to exert police power and extend social benefits to an ambivalent or resistant population. 
I've stated before that we find ourselves in an ideal moment for a fundamental reevaluation of our goals in Afghanistan in our efforts to protect United States citizens from international terrorists. I do not seek to prejudge our witnesses or the administration's strategic re review. However, I do think that with precious blood and scarce treasure at stake, it is incumbent on the administration to come forward with a compelling case for any United States commitments. And it's incumbent on those of us in the Congress to conduct thorough and thoughtful oversight and to ask tough questions. In the end, we use the microscope and the telescope to ensure that we do not use a machete where a scalpel will do. Uh, with that, I uh, defer to my counterpart, Mr. Flake, for his opening remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, today's hearing is uh, especially important and timely given what the administration is going through now with this review. Um, as we all know, this conflict is in its eighth year. During that time, we've seen progress and we've seen regress. Uh, in the wake of the 2001 invasion, we saw significant security gains. The, t the Taliban network was largely disrupted. Al Qaeda fled to the hills. A short time later, we saw Afghans actually elect a democratic government. But in a rather swift time frame, our military and diplomatic effort, it seemed to be paying off at that time. But since 2006, <coughs> progress has deteriorated. Uh, having visited in 2004, and again this past December, I can say that the contrast was stark. As our witnesses, I'm sure, will describe, security has declined and the Taliban seems to be regrouping. Uh, this, of course, raises, a, raises serious questions whether al-Qaeda will be resurging as well. If, if the Taliban is, perhaps al-Qaeda is. Uh, with an estimated 1,400 NGOs operating in Afghanistan, and I found that number difficult to believe, but I'm told that that is correct, some 1,400 uh, NGOs operating, and nearly 38,000 U.S. troops on the ground and billions spent, uh, we need to be getting it right. It's time for a fresh look. Since taking office, President Obama seems to have shifted policy in Afghanistan. On February 17th, he ordered 17,000 additional troops. This will bring the number of U.S. troops to approximately 55,000, the largest number ever deployed in that country. After having ordered these troops into combat, however, the President will receive the results of a high-level review of U.S. policy toward Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, it seems that following the decision to dispatch additional troops, the administration should de will determine what the policy should be. As we mentioned in the last hearing, it, it seems a, a little, little backward to be planning to deploy troops before we have uh, a, a, a strategy. But I hope that this hearing uh, will uh, shed some light on that. Today, I, I think we're hearing from what is probably the, the most qualified uh, uh, group that uh, has addressed this issue in a while. Uh, Dr. Kagan, in particular, just returned from eight days, I know, in Afghanistan on the ground. And uh, with the encouragement and support of uh, General David Petraeus, Dr. Kagan, and the other experts in his party were able to travel widely and observe many aspects of ongoing operations. He's published a lengthy review of his findings, and I look forward to hearing his testimony today, as that goes for all of the uh, witnesses as well. As uh, you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, we've contacted uh, the, uh, those in the administration. And, uh, and hope to uh, be, uh, be apprised as the details emerge on this new strategy. Uh, I look forward to this hearing, and thank you for convening it. Thank you very much. Well, again, I, I want to receive testimony now from the uh, witnesses that are here. Uh, Mr. Flake makes an excellent point. All of you spent a considerable amount of time in theater, uh, and I think that sometimes the public doesn't really get that the people that we invite in uh, to give us advice and counsel, actually take very risky assignments over there for lengthy periods of time and go places uh, oftentimes where members of Congress aren't able to go or don't have the time to really focus in and spend uh, as, as much concerted effort there as you have done. So we appreciate the risk that you take uh, and the effort that you make. I'm going to introduce the panel right across the board here, and then we'll start going from my left uh, to right. Uh, but first with us is Lieutenant General uh, David W. Barno of the United States Army, retired. He's the director of the Near East South Asia Center for Strategic Studies at the National Defense University. From 2003 to 2005, General Barno commanded over 20,000 U.S. and coalition forces in the Combined Forces Command Afghanistan as part of Operation Enduring Freedom. General Barno holds a Bachelor of Science from the United States Military Academy at West Point and a Master's in National Security Studies from Georgetown University. Ambassador James Dobbins joins us again. Uh, here, he's the director of the International Security and Defense Policy Center at the RAND Corporation. Ambassador Dobbins concluded his last stint of distinguished government service as special envoy for Afghanistan 
and then representative to the Afghan opposition following September 11, 2001. Ambassador Dobbins holds a B.S. in International Affairs from Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. He's testified previously before our subcommittee, and we welcome you back. Dr. Frederick W. Kagan is a resident scholar of the American Enterprise Institute. He served as an associate professor of military history at the United States Military Academy at West Point and holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in Soviet and East European Studies and a Ph.D. in Russian and Soviet military history from Yale University. Uh, David, Dr. David Kilcullen is a partner at the Crumpton Group, a strategic advisory firm based in Washington, D.C. He has previously served as a senior counterinsurgency advisor to the multinational force Iraq under the command of General Petraeus and as a county insurgency advisor to then Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. A native of Australia, Dr. Kilcullen holds a Ph.D. in politics from the University of New South Wales. Again, thank all of you for making yourselves available today and for sharing your substantial expertise. It's the policy of the subcommittee to swear you in before you testify, so I ask you to please stand and raise your right hand. I don't think any of you have anybody else that's assisting in your testimony, so do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. The record will reflect that all of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. I just tell those of you that I think you all know that your full written statement will be put into the hearing record. Uh, some of the statements were quite long. In fact, uh, uh, some have introduced a chapter in a book that I, I suspect we're not going to listen to the entire chapter on that. But we ask that you keep your remarks as close to five minutes as you can. We're as liberal as we can be on that because we want to hear what you have to say, and then we'll move to questions and answers. Uh, General, if we could start with you, please. Well, thank you, uh, Chairman Tierney and uh, Ranking Member Flake. Uh, thanks for the invitation uh, to offer my views today on uh, looking at strategic options on the way ahead in uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan. I continue to serve in the Defense Department in my current position, but my views that I'll express today are my own personal outlooks, uh, and they're informed not only by my 19 months in Afghanistan from uh, October 2003 to May of 2005 as the overall U.S. commander, but also from uh, continued engagement uh, and visits there to include a, a three-day trip in January of this year to uh, Regional Command South, uh, Kandahar Province, uh, Zabul Province, and Helmand Province. More importantly, my uh, youngest son just returned from a one-year tour in Afghanistan where he served as an Air Cavalry Scout Helicopter Platoon Leader in the 101st Airborne Division with uh, six months in uh, uh, Regional Command East in Jalalabad and six more months in and around Kandahar. So uh, I appreciate this not only from the perspective of a former commander there, but also now of a father of a soldier, as there are so many fathers and mothers out there of our troops that are serving overseas. And I anticipate he'll be returning to the theater uh, sometime in the next uh, year and a half or so. I'll try and touch on uh, some of my uh, more extensive written comments in, in my uh, observations up front here this morning. Uh, first and foremost, I would characterize uh, a bit of diagnosis. And I, and I think as I've looked at this over the last several years, uh, in part uh, in the aftermath of the transition to NATO, which happened at the end of 2006, that the overall enterprise in Afghanistan in many ways has been drifting towards failure. And I think the trajectory that we're on today, hopefully, which will be changed uh, dramatically by the President's uh, planned announcement here, I believe, tomorrow, uh, the trajectory we're on today is not a success trajectory. And we have to make some substantial changes uh, in our approach and in the overall you know, leadership outlook and organization, perhaps, of the effort to uh, move us towards success. I think first we need to talk a bit about what are the goals in Afghanistan, and to the chairman's question, what are we trying to achieve in Afghanistan? And I, I generally would characterize those as, as five key goals that I think are unchanged from the United States in many ways from our earliest days there. The first of those, and most, most important, is uh, the Taliban and al-Qaeda are defeated in the region and denied usable sanctuary in that part of the world. And the purpose of that, of course, is to, to prevent further attacks on the United States uh, and our allies. Secondly, I think Pakistan has to be stabilized as a long-term partner to the United States that's economically viable, friendly to our interests, no longer an active base for international terrorism, and in control of its territory and its nuclear weapons. Uh, third, I think uh, a stable and sustainable Afghan government uh, has to exist that's legitimate in the eyes of the Afghan people, capable of exercising effective governance and in control of its territory. Uh, fourth, I think NATO must succeed. We have made a commitment uh, that's irreversible at this point that the military mission is going to be led through the NATO alliance in Afghanistan, 
we, we cannot allow that to fail. We must ensure that our objectives there are cast such that the transatlantic alliance is preserved uh, and that U.S. leadership in that alliance helps us to deliver success. And then finally, I think that we have to ensure the region is confident of American staying power and commitment as a long-term partner that's not going to leave as we've done in the past, but stays there and, and shares the challenges in front of our many friends in the region there. there. There's three basic first principles that I think we need to touch on uh, to accomplish this as we look at perhaps some changes in our approach in the next several years. And, and some of these are, are well known, but they they're, tend to be absent in some cases when implemented. First is the Afghan people have to be the center of gravity of this effort. We have got to focus, I think, our upcoming counterinsurgency efforts on securing the population, providing them the time and space to have economic and political growth, and ensuring that, that their day-to-day -day lives are, are viable and that they have hope for their future. Second, I think we need to uh, focus on <clears throat> creating true unity of effort in the overall military and civil enterprise in Afghanistan. And that's not only between the military effort and the civil effort, but also even within the military effort where we have 41 different troop contributing nations. And in some cases, we, we, we almost see 41 different approaches uh, to the fight in Afghanistan. We, we've got to meld that into a singular approach. And I think U.S. leadership is key in doing that. And then finally, I think we have to take a simultaneous top down from Kabul and bottoms up from provinces and district approach to, to build success at the grassroots levels, often led by our military units, especially in the southern half of the country, which is the most dangerous portion, what I term the counterinsurgency zone, and that we've got to build this from the bottom up and the top down, not simply achieve greater success in Kabul. Uh, I think I'll pause there and, and uh, I'll defer my comments on Pakistan until we get into the Q&A, but Pakistan is obviously a part of the problem and a part of the solution. I don't accept the idea that we can't achieve progress in Afghanistan unless we achieve success in Pakistan, but the two of those nations are very clearly interrelated and we have to have an interrelated uh, policy that addresses both, re recognizing that they're individual nation states. And I'll, uh, again, defer further comments till Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much, General. A Ambassador. For inviting me back. Um, you know, it was only two years ago that um, Iraq was hopeless and Afghanistan was the good war. Um, today, um, Af uh, Iraq's the success and Afghanistan's the quagmire. Um, I think it's worth reflecting on this, and I, what it demonstrates is that um, the, the dramatic change is possible um, and the turnarounds are, are possible. Uh, and I think uh, what we have to focus on is how we can turn around the situation in Afghanistan. Now, there are reasons to be cautious. Afghanistan is larger and more populous than Iraq. It's more isolated and inaccessible. It's far poorer and less developed. And it's been in civil war for 30 years. Yet we still have advantages in Afghanistan that we lacked in Iraq. First of all, the American presence in Afghanistan remains more popular than it ever has been in Iraq. Secondly, Karzai retains more popularity as a leader in Iraq uh, than any leader, uh, uh, more, more popularity as a leader in Afghanistan than any Iraqi leader has yet been able to secure. Thirdly, we have far more international support for our efforts in Afghanistan than we ever have in Iraq. Fourthly, levels of violence remain much lower, have remained lower in Afghanistan than they were, or indeed still are in Iraq. That's right. The levels of violence in Afghanistan are still somewhat level, lower, than they are in Iraq. Um, fifth, Afghanistan's neighbors and near neighbors, with the partial exception of Pakistan, helped form the Karzai government, fully accept its legitimacy, and wish to see it succeed. Finally, sectarian animosities in Afghanistan are less intense than in Iraq. Now, these conditions are changing, and for the most part, they're changing for the worst. Afghanistans are becoming increasingly critical of our presence. President Karzai is losing domestic and international support. Violence is increasing, and civilian casualties are climbing, threatening to generate new refugee flows and exacerbate tensions among ethnic groups. Thus, the shift in attention from Afghanistan, from Iraq to Afghanistan, has come none too soon. Um, in my written testimony, I've uh, suggested eight different uh, uh, tacks that we should be taking, um, some of which I think the administration either has or is about to uh, embrace. I'll only name them here um, and be happy to go into greater detail in my test in uh, response to questions. First of all, I think we need to unify the NATO and American command chains. 
Um, at the moment, General Petraeus is in command of only about half the forces in Afghanistan. And if we expect Holbrook and Petraeus to pull off in Afghanistan what Holbrook and Crocker pulled off in Iraq, I think we have to make sure that the military side of our effort and the allied effort uh, is under his uh, control. Um, secondly, I think we need to do the same on the civilian side. Uh, Congressman Flake noted that we have 1,400, um, or was it 14,000, I can't quite remember, NGOs. Um, and that's just symptomatic of the, of the effort that's needed to uh, coordinate the civilian effort. Thirdly, we need to bolster both the, mil uh, the civilian as well as the uh, American military presence in Afghanistan. I do think that is underway. Fourthly, we need to institute a bottom-up component to our counter counterinsurgency strategy to complement the top-down approach we've followed to date. This involves empowering local Afghans to help defend themselves, um, and it also involves trying to do what we did uh, in, um, in Anbar with the Sunnis, that is to co-opt at least some components of the insurgents and put them on our payroll instead of the Taliban's. Uh, fifth, we have to pay more attention to Afghan insurgent activities in the Pakistani province of Baluchistan, as well as the attention we're already paying to their activities in the Northwest Frontier province. Uh, sixth, we need to support the upcoming Afghan elections while remaining scrupulously neutral among the possible candidates. That means neither supporting Karzai nor criticizing him to the point where it looks like we're actually opposing his candidacy. Seventh, we need to intensify our engagement with Afghanistan's neighbors. And eighth, we need to make stabilizing and Pakistan, stabilizing and, Pakis, and pacifying Pakistan a global uh, priority, not just an American priority. Um, President Obama and other administration's officials have stated that the United States should scale back its objectives in Afghanistan. If this means matching our rhetoric to our resource commitments, I'm all for it. If it means allowing Afghanistan's downward spiral into civil war to continue, I'm not. It is possible that a more modest statement of American objectives in Afghanistan, one focused on ensuring that the country does not again become a sanctuary for international terrorists, can help in co-opting some of the insurgents who may be willing to break their ties with Al-Qaeda. Such an effort has to be approached very carefully, however, lest it open new fissures in the country even as others are healed. If Afghanistan's Tajik, Uzbek, and Hazara populations backed as they will be by Russia, India, and Iranian patrons, uh, conclude that the U.S. is reducing its support for the national government in Kabul in order to accommodate Pakistani-backed Pashtun insurgents, then we're likely to see a resumption of the large-scale civil war along a north-south divide, which racked Pakistan, Afghanistan throughout the 90s and led to al-Qaeda's introduction in the first place. American commanders may have local opportunities to bring insurgent elements over to our side, and they should be encouraged to do so. Um, but any effort to engage the insurgent leadership at a national level will need to be conducted by the government in Kabul with the support of the larger international community if this effort is not to tear the country apart. How then should we describe America's purpose in Afghanistan? Our job is neither to defeat the Taliban nor to determine the future shape of Afghan society. While free elections, rule of law, capacity building, counter-narcotics, and economic development may not be our objectives, they are important components of a strategy designed to, pop, to, win, to protect the population and win its support. The American purpose should be to reverse the currently negative security trends and ensure that fewer Afghans are killed next year than this year. In any counterinsurgency campaign, this is the difference between winning or losing. If more Afghans are killed in, two, in, two, in 2010 than 2009, we'll be losing. And if less are getting killed, we'll be winning. And that's how we'll know. If as a result of our efforts, the current rise in violence is reversed and the populace made more secure, the Afghan people will be able to determine their own future through peaceful rather than violent competition of ideas, people, and political factions. This has already begun to happen in Iraq. Our objective should be to give the Afghans the same chance. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Dr. Kagan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Flake, um, for inviting me to uh, participate in this hearing on uh, this uh, outstanding panel, um, where I suspect we will find not a tremendous amount of disagreement. Um, because Which is too bad, because we really thought we were going to get a lot of disagreement, but in other words, it might not be too bad after all. Well, 
Um, it's, it's a little hard because I think if you look at this problem, there are elements of it that are incredibly complicated and there are elements of it that are fairly straightforward. And um, although if the problem were simply preventing al-Qaeda from reestablishing safe havens in Afghanistan, and I don't think it is, um, and if it were the case that it was possible to do that with some sort of counterterrorism uh, approach that relied primarily on special forces and long-range missile strikes, which I don't believe is the case, then we could actually have a discussion, I think, um, about alternatives. But unfortunately, the problem in Afghanistan is much greater than that. It's more significant than that. And also, unfortunately, I'm not really aware of a, of a, of a case in the last 10 years when the pure counterterrorism approach has worked. And so I don't find that to be um, a, uh, an appealing intellectual alternative to try to pursue because it has been tried on a number of occasions and it has failed. Al-Qaeda is not actually susceptible to that sort of defeat, in my view. But stepping back for a minute, I think it's absolutely right to ask the question, why are we in Afghanistan and what are we trying to achieve? And I would submit that the reason we're in Afghanistan is because of the extremely important geopolitical role that Afghanistan actually plays in an area that encompasses um, a billion and a half people uh, with a lot of nuclear weapons. Um, and the key point here is that what you're seeing in Afghanistan, among other things, is a great game being played out between India and Pakistan and Russia and Iran and China and now us um, for uh, regional objectives. And we know well that the Pakistanis are uh, supporting elements of the enemy groups, both the uh, Quetta Shura Taliban and the Haqqani network, um, which are, I think, those two groups, the greatest threat to stability in, Pakistan, in Afghanistan, rather. Um, and they're doing that for a variety of reasons, um, but largely because it is a part of the competition with India. And I don't think that they will stop doing that unless it is made clear to them that those groups will not succeed and that there will in fact be a stable Afghan state backed by the West, not just the United States, but backed by the West, um, that will make impossible the success of the proxies that the Pakistanis are preferring. And I think it's important to phrase it in that way because I think that unfortunately it is not just the case that the Pakistanis are acting defensively here out of fear that we will leave, although they are doing that. Um, even if we were not going to leave, even if they knew that we were not going to leave, the Pakistanis will still be concerned about the degree of Indian influence in Afghanistan, which will be significant. Indian companies invest in Afghanistan. India has an embassy there, which was not coincidentally attacked um, some time ago. And this is not something that would easily go away. The Pakistanis have to be convinced um, not just that there will be a government that they're happy with in Kabul, but that their preferred proxies will lose. And this is an incredibly important thing for Pakistan. And that's one of the things that I want to emphasize here. We have gotten into the habit, because we have forces fighting and dying in Afghanistan, of thinking about Pakistan as the country that we need to help us in Afghanistan. And the problem is that that has it reversed. The truth of the matter is Pakistan is more important to us strategically than Afghanistan. It's a country of 173 million people, 100 nuclear weapons, and host to four, at least four major terrorist organizations, two of which are focused on destabilizing Pakistan, one of which is focused on destabilizing the entire region, and one of which is focused on destabilizing the entire world. Now the question is, how can we best influence what goes on in Pakistan? How can we best understand what these groups are trying to do, and how can we best try to address the problem? Right now, we have the advantage of being in contact with the rear areas of all four of those groups in Afghanistan. And when I was on east of the Konar River, uh, a short walk for an Afghan, not for me, away from the Pakistani border, um, it was very apparent that the degree of visibility that we have on groups like the TNSM, like Betullah Massoud's Pakistani Taliban, like the Lashkari Toiba, and like Al Qaeda from Afghanistan is something that is irreplaceable. And if we were to withdraw prematurely from Afghanistan, if we were to abandon our efforts there, not only would those groups flourish, but we would lose an ability to understand what they're doing and to influence their behavior and to influence also Pakistani behavior toward them. And that's why I think it is time for us to stop focusing so much on the region as it can help us in Afghanistan and understand 
also the upside benefits of getting it right in Afghanistan, which include helping generate leverage vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan in a variety of ways, helping us to get the Pakistanis to focus on their own internal issues, which we have to be very concerned about, and also keeping us in close contact with enemy groups that are a real threat to global, global stability in a very fundamental way. And lastly, I just want to, I just want to say, uh, and I know that the committee is aware of this, but I, I'm not sure that the American people are, the situation in Afghanistan right now is nowhere near as bad as the situation in Iraq was at the end of 2006. And just to put a number on the table, the height of attacks in Afghanistan is less than a quarter of the height of attacks that we saw in Iraq. I was in Iraq in May of 2007, pretty much at the peak. Uh, Dave Kilcullen was there uh, in much more dangerous positions than I for much longer in that period. And we both know, he more than I, what that kind of violence looks like in a society. And that is not going on in Afghanistan right now. And I think that if we pursue a sound policy and resource it appropriately, there's no reason why that should happen in Afghanistan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Kilcullen. We have four basic problems in Afghanistan, and I thought I'd just talk about them quickly and then directly address your issue about uh, counter-sanctuary versus counter-insurgency. I think that we, there are four key things. We, firstly, we failed to effectively protect the Afghan population. We haven't made them feel safe. Uh, and that's especially true in the Pashtun parts of the country, which is basically the bottom half, the, the southern half of Afghanistan. Secondly, we failed to deliver the rule of law and effective governance to the Afghan people. Uh, and that's something that's happened uh, across most of the country. When I say we here, I'm not just talking about the United States. I'm talking about the whole international community and the Afghan government, because we all have responsibility uh, in that. The third problem is we failed to deal effectively with the active sanctuary for the Taliban in Pakistan. Uh, and I want to echo what uh, what Fred Kagan just said about uh, those points. And finally, we failed to organize, uh, resource, or structure ourselves to do any of those three things. So we're not securing the people, we're not delivering governance, we're not dealing with the Pakistan problem, and we're not structured or organized to do any of those things. So there is a requirement to reorganize the effort, and there's a requirement to resources resource it adequately. But we also, also have to look at what's our strategy, what are we trying to do here, and is it effectively delivering on those, those three requirements that I, I first talked about. You put up the um, <clears throat> dichotomy between counter-sanctuary and, and, and counter-insurgency, and that, that's exactly the debate I think that's been happening in Washington for the last uh, couple of weeks. So it's an accurate reflection of, of the issue. And I would characterize what some people have called counter-terrorism plus as the idea that we just want to deny an al-Qaeda sanctuary in uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan. And what we need to do is essentially be able to strike and disrupt uh, terrorist targets that emerge uh, in that region. There's a couple of problems with that. And I, I think that it's kind of a false dichotomy because you actually cannot do counterterrorism without also doing a fairly substantial amount of counterinsurgency. Um, and I, I hope you'll bear with me, but I, I used to do this stuff for a living, so I want to explain to you what happens when an intelligence asset is working with a special forces asset to target a terrorist. Your intelligence asset has to have eyes on the terrorist target, and it has to know where the target will be, not now, but in flight time plus preparation time plus approval time for the strike asset. So if I'm the intelligence asset and my strike asset is a special forces unit and the special forces unit is close by, it's 10 minutes flight away and it takes half an hour to get ready and it takes five minutes to get approval, then I have to know where the terrorist target is going to be in 45 minutes time from now. That's hard, but it's possible. If my strike asset is a naval ship in the Indian Ocean and my strike method is uh, cruise missiles and it takes me eight to 12 hours to get approval out of Washington, then I need to know not where the target's going to be in 45 minutes, but where it's going to be tonight. That's impossible, almost always impossible. That's why we didn't get Osama bin Laden during the 1990s. That was the setup. We had intel assets on the ground, approval from Washington, and our strike assets were in the Indian Ocean. 
So that means that if you are going to do effective counterterrorism, you have to have bases close to the target. And let's say the strike asset that you're talking about is a special forces unit of 50 people. That means you've got to have those guys on a base and you've got to protect them effectively, which is probably going to take about a battalion, about 600 people. And you need to have lines of communication and logistics units and all sorts of support assets like helicopters and airfields and so on to make that work. And that means you need to have a relationship with the local population. Because if you're going to have a base in someone's area, you have to have some kind of relationship with them where they're willing to give you the information to find the enemy and you, know, you don't have to continually defend the base against attack. And that means you have to deliver to the population some kind of quid pro quo. Most fundamentally, you have to protect them against terrorist retaliation for them tolerating your presence or helping you. But you also have to help them with governance and development, uh, rule of law, and a, a certain variety of other things in order to just function in the environment. So what all that long-winded explanation means is it turns out that if you're going to do counterterrorism effectively, you need bases in Afghanistan. And if you're going to have bases in Afghanistan, you have to do a certain minimum amount of counterinsurgency for those bases to be viable. And it turns out that the, that minimum level is quite high. Uh, and the logic that I've just gone through is exactly the logic that the United States used uh, in establishing air bases in Vietnam in 1965. Uh, we wanted to strike the North Vietnamese using aircraft. We needed to protect the aircraft. We needed to secure the areas around the bases. And we found ourselves dragged in gradually to a much larger commitment than was initially envisioned. So the reason I'm laying this out for you is to say, we can pretend that we're doing counter-sanctuary. We will actually be doing counter-insurgency. And I think it's better that we don't pretend, uh, that we think up front about what the requirements are likely to be. Um, and then the, the final point would, would be to say that the numbers of troops deployed, the numbers of diplomats that you put in the field and the aid spend, how many dollars you're spending, the overall raw number of, that, of those figures is actually less important than the effectiveness of their delivery on the ground. Uh, right now, some aid agencies that are working in Afghanistan are spending 80% in overhead and only 20% of their effort is actually reaching the Afghan population. Similarly, we have some uh, allies who are sitting on forward operating bases and extremely rarely are they getting out and dealing uh, with the population. Uh, an Afghan provincial governor said to me, look, you have enough troops to secure my province. You just have to get off the FOB, the forward operating base. Uh, another meeting that I was in was between a European ally uh, and an Afghan provincial governor. And the allied commander said, uh, you know, we're not sure that you guys are ready to take control of the province if we leave. Uh, and the Afghan governor laughed in his face and said, if you left tomorrow, the only difference it would make would be that we'd inherit your base. You don't actually get out of your base and do anything. So it's not just what, how many troops we have. It's what those troops do. And they have to focus on securing the population. And that means close interaction with people and delivering effective governance, rule of law, human rights, all those sorts of things that we need to deliver so that we can deal with the terrorist threat. Uh, so I'll stop there and perhaps uh, put forward to Q&A. Well, thank you, uh, Doctor, and thank all of you for uh, enlightening testimony on that. We're going to go into our question period here uh, with you all familiar with, and uh, unfortunately we're still uh, stuck in this five-minute uh, rule, but we'll try to relax it as much as we can, and, and I don't mind if any of my colleagues have a follow-up question they want to interrupt me with on this so we get to a subject matter all the way out. Um, f first of all, let me start where we, where we ended, the need to have cooperation amongst our allies. Uh, on this basis. Uh, we've visited at various times different PRTs, and they're operated differently. Uh, you know, wherever you go, there's some that never get off the base. I won't mention any companies, but, you know, wine for lunch, you know, you're in there for a five-month turnaround period, you hang around, the locals say, you know, they never get off the base. You know, as soon as they came in on the rotation and the other people left, the insurgents came back on that. And then you have other people that came in and they say they, this other group came in and they were very effective in pr protecting us. How are we going to be able to exert the kind of leadership that the United States historically has had with NATO and, and other international efforts, or is the relationships, uh, are the relationships so poisoned uh, that that's going to interfere with our ability to do that? And if that's the case, how successful can we be? Um, <clears throat> well, I think that the, the, the short answer is the relationships, I think, are not so poisoned that, that this cannot be uh, dealt with. And one of the things that I found very uh, cheering 
uh, on this last trip was uh, my visit to RC South to the staff down there, uh, where you have a Dutch commander and a, a British deputy and an American deputy and, and, a, and a hodgepodge staff like that. Um, and I think that there's a, there is an understanding in that area that we have to coordinate our efforts better and we have to make this work. And I think that uh, plans to bring in a division, British division headquarters down there uh, will make that easier. And, and we should remember that we do have allies who are willing to get off uh, the bases and are willing to go fight very hard, um, particularly in RC South, but also in RC East. The French uh, fight very hard without caveats in RC East. The Poles fight very hard without any caveats in RC East. Um, and I think that progress can be made in RC South where the biggest fight is. So I think that the relationships are not poisoned to the, to the extent that this is not fixable. I think, however, that the command relationships in the theater are such that this is very difficult. And I want to highlight a point that I think all of us are concerned about, that the absence of a three-star American headquarters in Afghanistan parallel to the position that Lieutenant General Odierno held in Iraq under General Petraeus during the surge is a major problem. Uh, it puts a tremendous amount of burden on General McKiernan to not only do all of the political coordination with 41 different nations and 1,400 NGOs, but also do all of the military coordination among all of the different units that are going on with an inadequate staff and with no subordinate operational commander. And I think that's one of the biggest problems that we've had in coordinating this effort, frankly, and I think that that's something that really needs to be addressed as a matter of priority as we think about changing our strategy and fixing this problem. Thank you. Well, you know, to uh, use General McNeil's favorite term of kinetic, I mean, there's a lot of uh, populations of some of our allies who are sending a clear message politically to their leadership that they don't want their forces getting involved kinetically on this. Uh, General, what do you think about the prospects of changing that local atmosphere to enable some of these governments politically to change the relationship there? I think the uh, structure we have in Afghanistan today is basically split between north and south. The northern part of Afghanistan, and you could draw a line right across the country, an equator, if you will. North of the equator is uh, what I would characterize as the stability zone or the peacekeeping zone. And that's the NATO countries that have selected to go there have done so very deliberately because their populations, uh, and in many cases their governments, are only willing to have their forces in Afghanistan to do peacekeeping. I was at the uh, Munich Security Conference in uh, February here, and, and I, I picked up one of the conference newspapers, and there was an article uh, written by the German defense minister, and the title of the article, and it had a picture of German troops in Afghanistan. The title of the article was Bundeswehr, a peacekeeping force, Bundeswehr being the German military. That, that would have been unthinkable 10, 15, 20 years ago. That was not what the Bundeswehr was, but, but the European militaries in many cases not in all cases, but in a number of cases, have moved into a, a political world where their support is only contingent on the type of missions they do, and the only justification for that is peacekeeping in the view of their population. So if you're in the north, I don't think your population or your governments are going to change and suddenly drop your caveats and be willing to fight in the south. If you're in the south, as Fred points out, and we have a number of you know, very capable allies down there with us in the south, uh, they're going to continue to support that, but, but they're on a timeline as well. They're, they're very concerned, from what I heard at Munich, from uh, uh, the popular will of their nations to continue this fight. So I, I think the U.S. is going to have to continue to, and really I hope the new, uh, new strategy that comes out will really uh, highlight reasserted American leadership in Afghanistan. This will not work without us being behind the steering wheel, with our friends and allies there, but we're going to have to be behind the steering wheel, and we, we in some ways have not been for the last couple of years. You want to say anything, Doctor? Yeah, just a quick comment. I think that we've spent a lot of time in the last two or three years, certainly um, I did when I was working for Secretary Rice, trying to convince the Europeans to fight uh, in Afghanistan. Um, I think we have a better chance of doing that now. There's a much more receptive attitude to the United States uh, in European capitals than there was even six months ago. But I think uh, ultimately we're not going to get very far by asking the Europeans to do something that's politically impossible for them. And we should be focusing on things that they are willing to do, uh, which would include uh, governance assets, um, aid dollars, but also police. The Europeans have a very substantial, uh, about 5,000 people, uh, organization that does stability policing, kind of gendarmerie, carabinieri kind of uh, capability. Uh, I expect that to be discussed in Strasbourg next week. Uh, and, you know, more police effort would be an extremely important way of shifting the effort away from chasing the bad guys towards protecting the population uh, and displacing the Taliban from 
their current de facto role of law and order uh, in the south of the country. So I think that allies are very important. Uh, we should be focusing on police, aid, governance, and hey, if they can give us more military asset, that's great. But I, I don't think it's a particularly likely prospect. Ambassador, if uh, Mr. Flake's just, indulgence will let you weigh in. Just briefly, I, um, I, I made a couple of suggestions in my written testimony designed to address the difficulty of coordination. One would be to create a multinationally staffed office in Kabul, the function of which would be to, um, to coordinate, uh, standardize, resource and support the, 20, the two dozen PRTs in the country, over, over half of which are not American. So they, they need a coordinating mechanism. NATO can't do it because NATO doesn't do economic affairs. Uh, the, uh, the UN isn't going to do it because it's essentially a military, a mixed military civilian uh, mission. So it, it'll have to be an ad hoc, something special. We created these kinds of institutions in Bosnia. We can create one that can funnel resources and standardize their approaches to the extent that's possible. A second, and I mentioned this in my, uh, in my uh, earlier testimony, would be to create a major NATO command in Tampa to give uh, Petraeus a major NATO command, make him responsible to the North Atlantic Council as well as to the President of the United States, um, uh, and, uh, and thus McKernan would come under one command change rather than the two command chains that he com currently comes under. Well, thank you. Uh, Mr. Flake. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank all of you. This was uh, very enlightening. I heard some uh, things that I, I hadn't thought of before at all. The first one was uh, Dr. Kagan mentioned the influence of or, or the worry about uh, from Pakistan about the influence of India uh, in, in uh, Afghanistan. How do we address that? Is there a way for the U.S. to address that, to mitigate fears that the Pakistanis may have about Indian influence? Um, with the caveat that I'm not a I'm not a South Asia specialist and certainly not an India uh, specialist, my I think the short answer is no. Um, I think that you know we have to keep in mind that Pakistan as a state and the Pakistani military in particular is defined by the threat from India and opposition to India, um, and I think that it is a multi generational task uh, to wean Pakistani leadership away from that sense. Um, I think that we can certainly make efforts, and we should certainly make efforts, um, and people have spoken about a regional security architecture and trying to find ways of having the Indians and the Pakistanis reassure each other. Um, but I'm skeptical about any short-term benefit from that. So I think that's why I think the key is to demonstrate to the Pakistanis, first and foremost, that the current strategy that they're using that is destabilizing Afghanistan against our interests will fail. Not that it's not desirable necessarily from their standpoint, but that it simply is impossible. Thank you. Ambassador Dobbins, I, I like what you said about uh, the coordination of the PRTs. Uh, I think those of us who have visited Afghanistan and have seen and met with some of the, the individuals involved or have been briefed by them here uh, recognize that there's very little coordination, even among our own, uh, let alone among uh, uh, the other uh, you know, nationalities that are there, there, there seems to be uh, very little sharing of best practices among them um, and, and very little coordination. And so it seems to be, uh, it seems to me that we're wasting a lot of, of resources. And so uh, your idea of having some kind of coordinating arm uh, seems to make uh, a lot of sense to me. Um, with regard to, to uh, uh, counter sanctuary, um, Dr. Kokolan, you mentioned that that's kind of the, what we did in or tried to do in Vietnam for a while. What other examples uh, are there of this strategy being employed, and are there any successful examples? Uh, anybody who wants to, General, if you want to chime in, or anybody, um, uh, are there well, successful examples of that strategy being employed? It depends on how you define success. Yeah. Um, but I would characterize our approach to Somalia. Um, as one of basically counter sanctuary right now uh, and at various other times in the past actually um, in relation to the, the Horn of Africa. Um, the, the problem with a counter sanctuary approach is that one of two things happens. Either you end up uh, focusing solely on killing the terrorist and forgetting about the stability of the, the general region where, you, where you're working and right. ultimately the, the problem gets bigger or you get dragged into stabilization operations, as we did in Somalia in 92, uh, as we did in Vietnam in 1965, that are designed to support 
strike or support uh, counter sanctuary and they kind of drag you in, which means that you don't think ahead to what the resources are likely to be that are required. Uh, so I, I'm not aware of any successful examples long term of a pure counter sanctuary approach. Uh, but we've tried it in various places and in fact it's a preference that most Western democratic powers have uh, because we, we like to uh, uh, avoid commitment of, of heavy troop numbers on the ground. It's not exactly counter sanctuary, but one of the things that we did in Bosnia in the Balkans, in the early part of the, the fighting in the Balkans, was designed almost like counter sanctuary, just to contain the problem and prevent it from spilling over and not ultimately deal with the, the main causes of it. Uh, and of course that failed and we had to engage much more heavily in order to deal with the problem. You could also characterise what we did in 05 and 06 in Iraq uh, as an attempt to walk back to a counter-sanctuary approach. And again, that dramatically failed and we had to get in and take control of the environment. General, do you have any other thoughts on that? Very briefly, I, I think uh, in effect what Pakistan is doing today in, in their uh, tribal areas is, is a failing counter-sanctuary strategy. They, they, because they are not able to and, or they have chosen not to have a population-centered counterinsurgency strategy, they're, they're operating simply with strike operations out there. Uh, and the effect is that the terrain is still not inhospitable, the population is not inhospitable to the terrorists because there's, you know, the terrorists occupy that terrain far more than the Pakistani military and security forces do. So it, it's a very, very difficult strategy to be able to execute successfully. And I, I think that most, if not all of us, would agree that it, there, there's a place within your counterinsurgency strategy for a counterterrorism pillar, if you will, mm -hmm. or a counter sanctuary pillar. But counter sanctuary, in and of itself, I, most most of us, I think, would, would say can't be a successful strategy, in, at least in the circumstances we have today out there. Right. <coughs> if but, I. Is that okay? May I, may I comment? Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I, I think we've seen, I think just to put a very fine point on this. Um, we have killed, we killed many, many, many senior al-Qaeda in Iraq leaders, including Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, in 2006. And we discovered that the insurgency, or the terrorist groups are able to replace their leadership faster than we can kill them uh, in many circumstances. And I've heard similar quotes <coughs> from guys involved in the counterterrorism effort in Afghanistan saying, hey, you know, we've killed 22 uh, HVTs and it's, you know, they just bring, they just bring new ones. It, it is not, I'm not aware of any case where this has worked, and we have tried it at the levels ranging from no U.S. troop presence, including, as, as Dave Kilcullen pointed out, in the 1990s in Afghanistan and recently in Somalia, where it doesn't seem to be working, certainly didn't work in Afghanistan, to high U.S. troop presence surrounding bases with a lot of special forces guys going around and actually killing a lot of leaders, as in Iraq and as the Pakistanis have done in uh, their tribal areas, and it's failed there, too. And so I think that we, it really is time to say, uh, we've tested this method, and there is a lot of empirical evidence to think that it will fail. Right. I'll wait for this second round for some more. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Treehouse, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, gentlemen, so much for coming here today. And I think you've uh, appropriately explored the complexities uh, of the situation in Afghanistan. I, I had the opportunity to visit Afghanistan a few weeks ago for the first time. And as a, a former Peace Corps volunteer who has spent many years in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, I, was, uh, I was profoundly impacted by the, the poverty that exists in Afghanistan, as well as the complexity of the long-term economic sustainability of the country. Um, and, and that's really what I would like to get at. Um, I, I believe that a surge in troops can, in fact, uh, provide temporary security uh, for the Afghani populations. Um, however, I am very concerned about the long-term sustainability of our efforts. And I, I'd like to approach it from two different angles, really. Um, the economic development sustainability over the long term and also the rule of law. Um, I, I was uh, saddened to learn of uh, almost a complete breakdown in the rule of law. And it doesn't seem to me that uh, our efforts are very sustainable over the long term without establishing a significant rule of law. Now, that doesn't necessarily necessarily have to be centralized. It could be a decentralized structure similar to what they have in Botswana, where there is a, a traditional structure that mirrors a, a centralized structure. But um, when I looked at the PRTs, it, there didn't seem to be a lot of consistency with regard to the PRTs. And there, 
is the ability or the temptation, perhaps, for a great deal of corruption um, when it comes to the PRTs dealing with the local population. When I heard stories of literally bags of cash uh, being used in development efforts, uh, it you know little alarm bells were going off all over. So I, I guess what I'm asking is, is what do you suggest when you look at the PRTs and you look at the economic sustainability of some of these efforts? What steps do you think have to be taken in order to uh, lead us down a path where the, the funding is being accounted for? Um, the, the appropriate mix between military and NGO and AID uh, uh, resources and, you know, what you believe is necessary for long-term sustain sustainability on the economic side. I might pick up the rule of law piece if that's all right, sir. And, uh, yeah. That's fine. We'll start with the other one. Um, <laughs> right now in Afghanistan, the Taliban are running 13 Sharia law courts across the south of the country. And when you hear the term Sharia law court, you think of you know women getting stoned for adultery and hands getting cut off and so on. And that does happen. But actually, about 95% of the work that these courts are involved in is what we would call civil or commercial law. So they issue ID cards, they issue title deeds to land, they sort out disputes relating to water, uh, grazing rights, properties, uh, they do divorce law. They're essentially delivering the rule of law, mediation and dispute resolution at the local level to uh, villages, districts uh, and tribal groups. This has been a very important source of their control because in a counterinsurgency environment or in a civil war environment, the population feels lethally destabilized and it feels like it has no way to be safe. These guys are providing you know, a normative system with rules to follow and if you follow these rules, you'll be safe. Um, and that's one of the things that gives them an enormous amount of attraction uh, to the Afghan population. If you contrast that with our approach. Could I, could I ask just for a second, if, if I might, Mr. Chairman, the, the Sharia law is obviously based on the traditional Islamic law. Are there more traditional uh, judicial structures that exist in, in the countryside that are based upon the traditional norms uh, versus Sharia law? Uh, there are. However, um, the, the tribal structure and the community structure in a lot of parts of Afghanistan is very heavily eroded by several decades of war and conflict at this stage. Um, and uh, tribal custom or adat or um, in some Pashtun parts of the country a very specific code of behavior is still valid but um, what the Taliban have tended to do is come in and replace a lot of that with their own control uh, through a, a Sharia system. If you contrast that to what we did, the Taliban are focused on delivering a service to the population at the local level. What we did, uh, after the Bonn conference, the Italians were given responsibility for the justice sector and the Germans were given responsibility for the police. Both those countries started building institutions at the level of the central state. So we set up a Supreme Court and we trained Supreme Court judges, we wrote a law code, we trained prosecutors and attorneys, and this is all happening at the central level. And meanwhile, the Taliban were in at the grassroots uh, delivering something to the population. In terms of the police, uh, we built a police academy and, and structures of, of command and control and so on in Kabul, but we didn't deliver effective police, community policing, to the population at the local level, and the Taliban also took that on. The United States got tired of the German approach in 2005, and we took it over and actually made it worse by turning the police into a counterinsurgency force and sending them off to fight the insurgents out in the countryside, instead of being in with the population in local areas, delivering you know, fairness, rule of law and justice to the population. Uh, so I think what we need to be taking is a much more bottom-up approach that focuses on competing with the Taliban, and you've got to compete with the Taliban on the basis of an agreed set of you know, human rights, uh, rule of law principles. The PRT officers who are doing the rule of law program uh, hampered by the overall structural approach that we've taken, which has been top down. Uh, and we need to move more to a bottom up uh, where we negotiate with local populations, come to an agreement and enforce protection and population security at the local level. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Treehouse. Uh, Ambassador Scherr. Just on, on delivery of, of assistance uh, and public services, one of the most effective uh, delivery methods is called the National Solidarity Program, which is an Afghan-run program to deliver um, small-level projects to villages and, and, uh, and towns based on what councils in those villages and towns say they want. So it's a bottom-up approach of defining the, the projects, and then the Afghan government delivers the resources. 
Um, naturally, it's being funded by international assistance. And so far, the U.S. has only put in 5 percent of the total, uh, and uh, we're 50 percent of the total aid for Afghanistan. So that's a very uh, a low allocation. Um, and I think one of the things we ought to be doing is increasing uh, the resources available to this Afghan-run institution and then l using the PRTs to support and facilitate its activity in areas that are contested. Thank you. Mr. Kucinich, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank the gentleman. I, I would just uh, like to uh, make some observations and ask for members of the panel to respond. Uh, in, in assessing the reports that we've received over the last uh, year from Afghanistan, uh, I think it's fair to say that the hope for security that we wanted to bring to the Af uh, Af people of Afghanistan doesn't exist, and that we, um, uh, we, we haven't achieved security for the people. We, um, apparently there's no or limited capacity to hold the borders. There's uh, no or limited capacity to govern. Uh, there is no real focus on Afghanistan, and I would respectfully submit to the administration that just sending 17,000 troops doesn't mean that you've refocused the mission. Uh, there's limited military resource available for the United States of America. There's finite resource with respect to our domestic economy. We have a poor track record there, awful strategic thinking. Uh, you have a war and an occupation in Iraq, which wasn't necessary, and a and, and an uh, occupation in Afghanistan that's uh, been dubious. We still haven't looked at the uh, implications sufficiently of the fact that Pakistan seems to be core to so many of these problems to begin with. Does it cause any of you to start to rethink the underlying assumptions about uh, military presence there and what's achievable? Uh, particularly within the, if you look at it through the lens of the uh, experience historically, the experience of the British and the Russians. I'd just like to hear your response. Maybe I could start just briefly. Uh, um, I, I think it's important also to, to reflect the broader context of our participation there. In, in clear, clearly, we all recognize it was initiated because of 9 11. But, but I think the reason that it's important for us to succeed in this area is because of the strategic neighborhood shown up on that map there that this represents. If we look at the global threats to American security today, I think I can make a pretty reasonable argument that the principal threat to American security, to the security of the American people, comes from this region. And so in terms of having military forces there uh, to prevent that threat from being realized and to roll that back and to reduce that and to help with our civilian uh, counterparts to be able to establish a stable region that ha is economically viable, that has you know reasonable degree of governance and rule of law, and, and it doesn't you know go off the edge of the cliff and become once again you know a launching ground for attacks on the United States or our allies. I think that's an extraordinarily important and valuable objective. And, and our military forces, again in concert with you know the civilian dimensions of this. Are, are, I believe, essential in order to achieve that objective. I don't see any other means by which to do that. We certainly have had some problems, in, in, which I, I clearly recognize in the last two to three years in Afghanistan, but I've also seen what success can look like in Afghanistan. And I think with, with a revamped effort here in the next two to three years, we have great prospects to turn this around. Do you see any hazard in which an occupa uh, an ex a more extended occupation would fuel a more extensive insurgency? I don't, I don't view this as an occupation, but more importantly, the Afghans I talked to, and I had this discussion with Afghan and Pakistani military officers yesterday here at my they reject the idea that this is an occupation. They, they want the international forces there. The polling that's done even in the population very much supports that the 50, 60 plus percent range, the presence of international forces there is the only thing that can keep Afghanistan from descending back into civil war into chaos. So this, this is not viewed that way, even though we see a lot of media reporting that would indicate that. The, the objective measures in Afghanistan say that that's not how it's looked at. Anyone else want to try to respond to? The, we often hear this graveyard of empires argument. You know, the British couldn't hold Afghanistan, the Russians couldn't hold Afghanistan, the Persians couldn't hold Afghanistan. Why should we think that we 
will be able to uh, succeed in Afghanistan. The fundamental difference, which the Russians never had and the British never had, is that we have a very substantial level of support from the Afghan population. Um, there have been some recent polling uh, figures that have really supported that. Um, I'm going to quote to you from the less positive one. Um, the more positive ones, I, you know, let's discount them and go to the, 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 the most negative, which is the ABC, BBC and ARD poll that was conducted on the 30th of January this year. Um, Karzai's approval rating, President Karzai's approval rating in Afghanistan at the moment is 52 percent. Uh, How do they poll the tribes? Uh, it's a poll across the whole of the country, um, and it's uh, based on a cluster method. So it's not tribes they're polling, but villages and, uh, I, and I, districts. I, Mr. Um, Chairman, I, I think it'd be interesting to look at the methodology of some of these polls since they're being used to try to interpret public opinion. You should feel free to do so, Mr. Kucinich. I'm yeah. sure they're um, available the, publicly. You can, and, uh, you can get the you can get the uh, the poll online, and it has a whole section on methodology, which is uh, worth taking a look at. Uh, there is extensive polling that happens in Afghanistan. I'm quoting from the the least positive. 82% um, of people polled want the current government uh, in power. Only 4% uh, see any benefit in the return of the Taliban. 85% of people uh, think that the Taliban are the greatest threat to stability in Afghanistan. And interestingly, 63% of people support the presence of US troops, which is slightly higher than those who support the presence of other international troops. 63% uh, is enormous levels of support compared to anything that we've ever had uh, in Iraq or, in, or any of the other campaigns that we've been in. Do you know how many, you know what the percentage was of the American people who first supported the invasion of Iraq? These numbers have gone down about 20 percent in the last two or three years. So we're seeing a drop in support, but it's a drop from an extremely high level. Uh, so I think to say that the Afghans don't support the occupation is just not based on fact. The Afghans do support the population. Uh, in, uh, do support the presence of the international yeah, community. I, I, would, I would respectfully dispute the relevance of polling on uh, these uh, national security issues. Can I ask on, you, sir, on, both, you on both sides. Yeah. I, I, let, me, let me offer two other comments. I mean, it, polling is, is one of the me measures we have right now. It's not the only measure. But if we're going to dispute the, the polling numbers, we have to have something other than polling numbers to, to dispute them with. Uh, the other point I'd make is American popular support for the, the presence in uh, Afghanistan is important, but America is one of 41 countries that are, that are contributing to the, to the effort. Uh, and the most important player is actually the Afghan government, in my view. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank, thank you, you thank Mr. Kucinich. So, I mean, there's so many questions we're going to ask, and uh, we've narrowed the panel down here a little bit, so I think uh, Jeff and I will have a chance to do that if you have the patience for us. To keep Afghani support, uh, I, would there be a recommendation to limit the airstrikes and the raids that have been going on? Because I hear people talking about shifting our policy to more of one of defensive protective idea. And I'm, I'm, correct me if I'm going too far, that we think that perhaps having the offensive uh, continual strike aspect of it has not been terribly effective because they keep replacing themselves over and over again. But also, uh, we're getting the, the, the indigenous population more than a little riled up about um, the collateral damage that occurs and whatever drop in those polls may have occurred may somewhat be related to the effect of the airstrikes and the raids, which we heard earfuls of uh, when we were over there in our last several visits on, on that and seemed to have a tremendous impact. And, and that's understandably not a poll, but just you know, various groups that we talked to. Um, <clears throat> I, I agree with you that I think that what we've been doing has been uh, very problematic. I think not so much. The, the approach of going after key leaders, but I think it, it has to do with very specific tactics um, that we've tended to use on the ground. Um, at the end of the day, uh, night raids on villages is just, is just a really bad idea um, unless you really, really, really have to do it because you, have, you run into old Pashtu uh, views about how you know, when, the, when the cattle rustlers descend on the village at night, every you know, red-blooded young man with an AK has to run out and fight them. And you can explain to them all you want that cattle rustlers don't have helicopters, but the, the fact remains that there, there's that instinct to come out and do that. Um, there are other ways of conducting those kinds of raids. Um, I think that the command is, ha, is very sensitive to this. Um, the, the issue of collateral damage is a very interesting one, and I'd like to just drill down on that for one second, because this is a question of, there's a major cultural difference between Iraq and Afghanistan that we need to understand. The amount of collateral damage that's being done in Afghanistan is absolutely trivial compared to the amount of collateral damage that was done in Iraq 
with infinitely less complaint from the locals about the collateral damage. We rubbled Fallujah and Ramadi, and the complaint was not about the collateral damage on the whole. One JDAM goes astray in Afghanistan, and you have a huge uproar about it. Now, part of that is because the enemy we're facing has a magnificent information operation campaign, the best in the world that I've ever seen, and we've not been able to counter that effectively. But part of it is an Afghan tradition that is different from Iraqi tradition. Iraqis are much more comfortable fighting within their population. Afghans are very uncomfortable fighting within their population centers. That's why you see rural insurgencies in Afghanistan rather than urban insurgencies. And so I think this is, a, this is an issue that can be dealt with by appropriately modifying our tactics, techniques, and procedures for these kinds of raids. And I think that you'll find over time that the, the command has taken this on board and that the appropriate changes will be made. Now, I think it's generally agreed across this panel and the last panel that we talked to that um, most of the al-Qaeda, or if not all of the al-Qaeda, are situated now in Pakistan, that what we see going on in Afghanistan is uh, various insurgencies that have uh, more localized ambitions and uh, intentions on that. And one of the principal arguments that we always hear for keeping troops in, uh, at higher levels in Afghanistan is that uh, we can't let Afghanistan uh, fall, uh, fall to the insurgents because uh, we're afraid they'll invite al-Qaeda back in, and al-Qaeda will have a safe haven, and from which they'll cause problems. Uh, so I have two questions related to that uh, and, and seek an answer on it. One is, uh, I think that assumes that the last problems of 9-11 happened because of Afghanistan, when in fact uh, most of the uh, planning seems to have happened in Germany and Florida, and certainly could have happened whether or not uh, al-Qaeda was in Afghanistan. Uh, and secondly, there are other ungoverned areas from which al-Qaeda al is operating right now in Pakistan, it could be Somalia, it could be Sudan, it could be uh, any number of countries out there. And I've not heard anybody make the recommendation that we send enormous numbers of troops into those areas and start any of this sort of tactics uh, and strategies that we talk about here. So um, if, if what the principal threat to America, General, as you said, is, comes from this region, how is that so? Why is the principal threat from this region not uh, just by nature of the fact that uh, these people that have bad intentions towards America can plan uh, any place uh, like uh, Pakistan or Sudan or Somalia or Algeria, wherever it might be, um, and why don't we treat Afghanistan the same way we treat those regions in terms of what actions we take to be defensive? No, I think it's a very good question, and I, I would argue that the threat to put a you know fine uh, point on it would, is Al Qaeda, and Al Qaeda is resident in this region. They, they're not as physically present today in Afghanistan as they've been in the past. Uh, but they're very interested in reasserting that presence. They're in Pakistan because in some ways they've been pushed out of Afghanistan, mo mostly as a result of the res our response to 9-11, but they're still alive and active, and, and they require a sanctuary to be effective. They require protected areas to think, to plan, to train their operatives, and, and to have essentially a home base. Uh, our presence in Afghanistan is going to prevent that from recurring if we sustain it in the country of Afghanistan. It's also going to have a positive effect on Pakistan and their ability to keep pressure on al-Qaeda. Uh, in an unclassified setting, we can't talk, obviously, about what the U.S. may be doing directly against al-Qaeda in, inside those tribal areas. We read about inferences in the newspaper about that regularly. But, but I think our presence in Afghanistan is an insurance policy against al-Qaeda re resuming its full capability in Afghanistan and in Pakistan. And if, if we're not there, uh, the likelihood of the Pakistanis putting pressure on them uh, and being effective with that, I think, is extremely low. So success in Afghanistan will give us a much stronger position and likelihood of success in pressuring al-Qaeda and hopefully disrupting and destroying al-Qaeda inside of Pakistan. Hmm. Somebody else want to take a stab at that, Ambassador? I mean, I, I, I still have some questions left, General, after you give me that, uh, that answer, Ambassador. No, uh, I just say the, the proximate danger is not that Afghanistan is going to fall to the insurgents. That probably wouldn't happen even if we left. The Indians, the Russians, the Iranians would support the, the northern half of the country. That was one of my next questions. The proximate That's danger good. is that the country will, will descend deeper into civil war. Um, uh, civil war on the scale we saw in Iraq, which is, you know, ten times higher than what it is today in Afghanistan. Or si civil war such as we saw in the 90s or um, uh, in, in the 80s and 90s, which is probably ten times higher than what we saw in Iraq. Um, uh, five million refugees generated, um, and a, a sense of disorder um, and uh, that will invite in uh, extremist elements. I mean, even if, uh, even if the Taliban were to say, if you leave Afghanistan, we'll abandon al-Qaeda, and we left, 
that wouldn't end it. That would simply deepen the civil war, and Al Qaeda would come right back in, and other extremist elements. But, because but I guess you'd my be point is, you know, when I go back to my district, here's what a lot of people say: Al Qaeda is somewhere all the time. All right, they're, they're either in Pakistan, or they're in Somalia, or they're in Yemen, or they're in all these places, or whatever. And so, if they go into Afghanistan, they're just in one more place. Uh, you still got to have a policy, but the policy that you have in Afghanistan seems to be radically different than the policy you have to do with Al Qaeda presence in Yemen and Somalia and Sudan and Pakistan. You don't send troops in, you don't build bases, you don't do all of those things there, and that's the part that I'm trying to, to get at here uh, on, on that basis. So you know, you have this huge presence. You're building God knows how many forts out there, various sizes, sending in more troops, running around battling uh, Taliban that we admit are not Al Qaeda. Uh, all on the prospect that al-Qaeda might move back in. Meanwhile, they've set up residents in other places, and nobody's saying, well, geez, it's in the United States' interest to go in uh, full force with the military and, and the rest of the coalition into those places. That, that's something I've never really got a satisfactory uh, answer to, and, and uh, you know, I, I think it's, it still begs a question on this. Doctor, do you want to give it a shot? Uh, I, I do. I, I want to make the point, first of all, that not all al-Qaeda is equal. Um, there is Al Qaeda uh, global leadership cell. It is located in this vicinity. It had previously located been located in Pakistan. It is yes. It had originally been located in Afghanistan. Now it's located in Pakistan. Um, and you don't happens, recommend sending uh, troops into Pakistan and uh, full force, seventeen thousand or fifty thousand, and, and um, going after them? Do you? I, I don't recommend that, Congressman. Okay. But I would say to you, I would. But ask, you recommend doing that in Afghanistan, where Al Qaeda leadership is not. I rec. I've never tried to sell the war in Afghanistan on the basis of that's where al-Qaeda is and that's where we have to fight them. And I think it's unfortunate that a lot of rhetoric, including from um, uh, candidate Obama, focused on that uh, interpretation of the problem. I think that we have to be able to take a broader geopolitical view of this. But to address just the al-Qaeda question, we know that al-Qaeda global senior leadership is in, Af is in Pakistan. We are working uh, in a variety of ways to cajole and assist the Pakistanis to address that problem. What I'm here to tell you is that it is inconceivable that the Pakistanis will be able successfully to address that problem if we do not keep Afghanistan functional or make Afghanistan functional and stable. You can't separate these two issues in that respect. So if you abandon Afghanistan, you are also abandoning the effort you, to get the Pakistanis to Can you tell me why that is? Why absolutely, if, absolutely. Let's suppose that uh, that Afghanistan reverts back to its historical premise of fighting each other. Uh, this seems to be their natural state in some instances or whatever. And that happens. Why is it that all of a sudden Pakistan uh, is that much worse off than they've been in years past? Absolutely. First of all, I, I would make a serious suggestion to the committee that you hold a classified briefing and bring in as many of the intelligence analysts and experts as you can from the theater and have them lay out for you in detail how all of the enemy groups there are distinct and We had that last week. Uh, okay. I, and, and we did that with the DNI and other people who are supporting group were there, and I'm on the intelligence committee. I do it on a regular basis okay. on that. So. Um, the groups are heavily interconnected, and there are groups on both sides of the border that are related to al-Qaeda and related to other groups. In particular, the Haqqani network is moving in the direction of playing a, uh, a much greater role with al-Qaeda and Lashkar-e Taiba and these other very radical groups uh, than the Mullah Omar uh, Quetta Shura is. The problem is that the Haqqani network has uh, its base in Miram Shah in the federally administered tribal areas, but it has a very significant support zone in Afghanistan, in the Zadran Ark, in host province. Now, if we were to abandon Afghanistan, what you would find is that the Haqqani network, as an example, would absolutely reestablish itself in host province's traditional strength, and it would then immediately, I can promise you, provide facilitation and assistance to Lashkar-e Toiba and al-Qaeda and provide them refuge from any Pakistani attempts to go after those groups. If we can maintain host, as we are now maintaining it, as an area which is highly contested, uh, but where we are going after these guys, and I frankly think we need to go after them more in that area, then we create the possibility, and it's only a possibility, but we create the possibility for Pakistani success against al-Qaeda, if we can move them in that direction, actually to be decisive in this area. If you don't maintain control of Afghanistan, then I can assure you that any Pakistani success on their side of the border will be absolutely ephemeral. I guess, you know, so... You're trying to stop Al Qaeda from doing in pa Afghanistan what they've already done in Pakistan, what they've done in Yemen, Somalia, Sudan, everywhere else is set up base and be able to operate in, in somewhat ungoverned territories, and you're just doing it in an entirely different way. I mean, I hear what you're saying in terms of the fear is that they're all going to move in. I just, um, 
I still don't make the distinction of how we treat all these uh, different areas. And the other part, Ambassador, going back to, to your comments, if I go home to the district and people say, if your argument is put the Al-Qaeda situation aside for a second as a bigger, larger strategic need for the United States to be there, mostly is because we don't want to see Afghanistan break down into the Civil War again, what's your message to American people you know, who are absolutely beside themselves in the economic situation that's going on right now or exhausted uh, from all the time that we spent uh, diddling around in Iraq that was a totally unnecessary uh, place to be and have had now spent six or seven years in Afghanistan that have turned to be counterproductive to the point. How do you sell them with the idea that, gee, we just don't want a civil war in Afghanistan, so spend another 50 to $100 billion and send more of your children over there uh, and maybe you can help out? Um. Afghanistan is not a country which is um, predisposed uh, to civil war. It's a weak country surrounded by powerful neighbors, which is vulnerable to their manipulation. Um, left to its own devices, the Afghans can get along. Uh, the, the, the ethnic and religious and linguistic tensions are not as keen as they are in Iraq, for instance, or as bad as they were in the Balkans. Um, uh, it, is, it is a geopolitical question. Uh, Afghanistan will be at peace when the Iranians, the Indians, the Pakistanis, and the Russians agree that they have a common interest in a peaceful, non-threatening, functioning Afghanistan. But what are we doing um, in that regard? I mean, I, I, I think that's a point that you've made in previous uh, testimonies also, and it's an excellent point. Uh, but, you know, so where are all these countries that probably have a more immediate interest in this area than the United States does? I mean, it's the drugs that are going through Iran and India and up into right. Russia and the stands and into Europe. Uh, it's the unsettled area uh, that affects them more immediately than us. So where are they in all this? They have to be involved. And in fact, um, uh, the, the, Mrs. Clinton has called a meeting of regional powers um, in the next uh, week or two uh, in order to sustain a dialogue. Uh, we had a very successful engagement back in 2001 uh, with most of these countries, but Pakistan remained ambivalent and not ready to really commit to the agenda that all the other countries were willing to commit to. Uh, there's no s short term answer. You, you, you've got, you, we have, the long term objective is to create a regional balance in which all of Af Afghanistan's neighbors recognize that a non threatening uh, Afghanistan is in their interest uh, and don't use it to, uh, uh, to advance their interests vis a vis the other countries of the region. Uh, in my testimony, I have a rather elaborate suggestion about how to do that in terms of. Uh, uh, of an international agreement in which Afghanistan finally recognizes the border with Pakistan, which it refuses to do, has, has consistently refused to do. Afghanistan and Pakistan promise not to use their territory against the others. Uh, the U.S. and NATO promise to leave as soon as these other provisions are accepted. Um, and, and Afghanistan is declared a permanently neutral state. I, I think this is a viable uh, diplomatic objective. It's not something that's going to come overnight. But sorting out those differences is, uh, I think, a key to pacifying the area and thus reducing the sources that create these extremist groups that, are, that, that transit the region uh, and, in, in at least one case, have global objectives. Thank you. Uh, one second, uh, General, if I could get some information on what the votes are here for us. There's uh, going to be seven votes. Yeah. Uh, we could take about an hour on that part. So um, do you want to do another five minutes and then break and ask folks to come back or just come back? As um, I, I think uh, we'll have a hard time getting people back. These are the last votes of the day. Well, so. uh, I'm a person who'll come back <laughs> on that. <laughs> I, I, can, I know I you'll come back as well. But the, uh, so can we break for an hour while we get these votes done? Is that uh, something that you if folks I, are willing to do, come back can, for can another half hour? Question so? before we sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, Congressman, I'm not going to be able to do that. I've got okay. um, appointments. Let me ask you, Mr. Let me ask Mr. Kagan right now, Dr. Kagan, um, if I can. The the war on poppies there, is it a necessary uh, role for our military? Um, I know for the first time a while ago, uh, NATO okayed use of strike force, I guess, to, to uh, go at these. Or is it a distraction? Um, there's, I, I noted a, a, a very different reaction from President Karzai uh, when we saw him in December than we did four years ago. Uh, four years ago, he said this was the mother of all battles. Uh, this time, he dismissed it, saying it was not a problem. Um, in your view, is this a, a battle we have to wage militarily now in order to succeed, or is it a distraction? Um, 
it's well, it, it's sort of, it's a little more complicated than that. Um, I think the problem with the poppy eradication effort is that it has been sold as a part of the counterinsurgency uh, strategy, and I do not believe that it plays a, a positive role in the counterinsurgency strategy. Um, I recognize published reports say that something like $500 million a year go from the narco trade to the Taliban. I expect that's true. Uh, when you look at what the poppy eradication effort can do in terms of how much money it can actually take out of their pockets a year, um, the, the range is something between $25 and $50 million a year. That is not going to make a significant dent in their capabilities over the next few years. Um, that having been said, and therefore, I don't think that we should see this as part of the short-term counterinsurgency effort. And of course, there are negative consequences from the counterinsurgency point of view of eradicating poppies and, and pissing people off. But I do think that since we are concerned with establishing a stable, legitimate government in Afghanistan, and since I do think that the population sense of pervasive corruption in that government stemming from the narco trade is a major problem in its legitimacy, that we absolutely have to take this on board, I would say that I would much rather see, and I echo the sentiments of everyone who has lamented the absence of an effective rule of law program in Afghanistan, I too lament it, and I think it should be a major focus. I think that convict, having the Afghans convict two senior government officials, and that one of them doesn't have to be Karzai's brother, of uh, narcotics-related crimes would be more effective than killing thousands of hectares of poppy in helping to establish the government's legitimacy. Could I just make a quick follow-on comment? Um, it, poppy production has flatlined in the last two years. It hasn't actually got uh, larger. Uh, and what we've seen is, in fact, a very substantial shift uh, in geographical focus, where most of the poppy is now being grown uh, in enemy-controlled areas, particularly in Helmand province. Um, the other big shift, though, that we've seen has been uh, vertical integration, so that two or three years ago, they would take poppy and turn it into opium paste, then export the opium paste for sale. Now, they're actually producing heroin in country. And that actually creates an opportunity for the military to be in involved in interdiction, as distinct from eradication. Eradication hurts the farmers. If you take two or three fields worth of poppy and boil them down to 10 kilos of heroin, the farmers have already been paid if you interdict the 10 kilos of heroin later on. So there is a role for law enforcement and the military in the interdiction part of the process. And that avoids a lot of the the eradication issues that we've had. The final point I make is it's a $4 billion industry. Taliban gets about uh, 500 million out of that. The farmers get 800 million. The biggest beneficiary of the narcotics trade is the Afghan government, corrupt officials inside the Afghan government. So until we change that, I don't think we're going to get much progress. Uh, Thank you. I'm going to try. I know that several of you have difficulty coming back in an hour, so I'm going to try to fire off some questions here and, um, on that. Uh, Will the Afghan uh, elections be an appropriate measure as to whether or not our plan is working? How well they go? Is that a metric that people will be able to judge whether or not what we decide to do now is actually working? No, I, uh, I don't think so. All right, Doctor? Uh, yes, but I would. I think we perhaps disagree less than might appear. I think if it's not a measure of whether um, we're achieving security, who gets elected? It's whether the elections go off in a safe well, uh, and uh, transparent manner. If that happens, I think we can say we've done well. Okay, but Dr. Kagan, you disagree. Uh, Ambassador Dobbins? One of the strengths we have there is we have a legitimate government. We have a government that's, that's right. recognized throughout the world and by the vast majority of Afghans as genuinely representative, uh, legitimately elected, um, and, and that's a treasure. Uh, uh, the government may, may be more corrupt than we'd like, it may be less competent than we'd like, but it is legitimate. And um, if we lose that, if the, election is, uh, if the election results are contested or inconclusive in a way that the result doesn't clearly represent uh, popular expression, um, it will be a major setback. And yeah, I'd say it's, it's a uh, partial metric and it's an extraordinarily important one this year. It's the strategic report card this year on the entire enterprise, so it's got huge political implications as Thank well you. as military. Uh, Dr. Kilcullen uh, quotes in his book uh, Bernard Fall, who said in 1975, if you're losing to an insurgency, you're being outgoverned, you're not being outfought. Uh, and I hear a lot of uh, comments that may send to see that people agree on that. Um, how are we going to get the Karzai government to be better governors? And I think the similar question is in Pakistan, how are we going to get that government to be a better government? Because back to some of the things Ambassador put in his written testimony about perhaps conditioning uh, some of the assistance. The only leverage we have over these governments is 
uh, the money that we're putting in there, and I'm sure that you probably don't want to condition the civilian sorts of development and assistance types of things so much, but where the military has such a large play in uh, Pakistan and where you've got to get cars out to move in Afghanistan, ought we to be conditioning uh, the military aid that we give to these countries? I think that's very true in the case of Pakistan. In the case of Afghanistan, I think we can do a lot with a partnering model where we have uh, U.S. troops always working with Afghan troops and Afghan police. And one of the things we found in Iraq and also in the parts of Afghanistan where we've done this before is that when you do that, the performance of all three elements improves. The U.S. troops have a better understanding of the environment, so they do better. The Afghan troops have a model for how to operate, they do better. And you've got a police guy standing next to a military guy, and the military guy saying, why are you taking a kickback from that guy? Why did you beat that old lady up? And inform enforcing a uh, a more uh, Of course, if we, if we yeah. can get the people on, I grew about a 1,500 mentors shot at just on the police side of that. Yeah, and, and so this is not instead of mentoring, but it's it's you don't necessarily send mentors. You have the an presence. Afghan unit next to an American unit, and the unit performs a mentoring function. Doctor, you also said that we need to be reducing overall force commitment everywhere, not just moving troops from Iraq to Afghanistan. That would be tantamount to unboggling ourselves from Iraq just so we can rebog ourselves in Afghanistan. Uh, our, is everybody fairly certain that we don't need to be putting a, a large additional amounts of troops into Afghanistan to accomplish the counterinsurgency that you've all talked about? Or are there some people that believe that we need to put in some of the numbers that we've read, 400,000, you know, 600,000? I, I think the, uh, the, you'll probably find some consensus that that 400,000 number, which is mostly Af vast majority, which w will be new Afghan security forces, is probably a fairly good number of police and Afghan National Army. The U.S. troop contributions, we've seen the front end of that, at least, the 17,700. Uh, it's not clear exactly what will be announced tomorrow. Uh, but I think we have to be very careful from a military standpoint, and uh, Dave Kokal and I have, have written and talked about this, is we, we have to think about what we're trying to achieve this year, next year, and the following year, and how much military force we're going to need to do that. Getting that additional several hundred thousand Afghan security forces together generated, built, trained is going to take some time. The gap filler in a lot of ways will need to be American forces. Dr. Kagan, uh, do you want to shout at that? Yeah, I, I just want to say, you know, it's very hard for, for anyone to sit in Washington and make evaluations about the force requirements in Afghanistan, but um, I think when you do at least the, the sort of the, 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 when we go around theater and look at the threat problems and you look at uh, the gaps, I can see a requirement in Afghanistan for maybe 10 American brigades. Um, starting next year and lasting for maybe 12 to 18 months. We had, at the height of the surge, 22 brigades in Iraq. Um, I just I don't see a requirement for a commitment of that size from the United States uh, or anything like it. But I do think that there's a risk that we are going to lowball the estimate of what we need um, in the possibly in the President's statement. We'll see what he says, but certainly this year. But I, I also think we should not imagine that we are getting into uh, the slippery slope that leads us all the way up, you know, back to Iraq sort of levels. Well, let me let me end with this. So we we go in here. The uh, David Ignatius did an article on the, called the Roadmap for Afghanistan back on March 19th, and at one point he started talking about the typical um, Al Qaeda uh, situation. The process begins with infection, as Al Qaeda establishes a presence. Next comes contagion, as Al Qaeda uses a ha its haven to mount attacks. Then follows intervention by the United States to destroy Al Qaeda's sanctuary and its Taliban protectors, and that produces rejection as the local population allies with Al Qaeda and the Taliban against the foreign invaders. For America, it's a costly and self defeating exercise, which is precisely what Al Qaeda intends. Dr. Kilcullen quotes a haunting 2004 statement by Osama bin Laden All we have to do is send two Mujahideen to the, to the furthest point east to raise a cloth on which is written Al Qaeda in order to make the United States generals race there to cause America to suffer human, economic, and political losses. So we are continuing this policy of bleeding America to the point of bankruptcy. I think, you know, uh, a lot of people begin to think that that's the case here, or whatever. Uh, so how do we prevent uh, the Yemens and the Somalias and the Sudans or anything like that from being more of that bleeding? Um, at the same time, you're recommending sort of following that pattern into Afghanistan. Very briefly, I think this goes back to the geopolitical issue, though, that Ambassador Dobbins points out. Th those other locales you identified, the Yemens, the Somalis, I, I would call those very small franchise operations of Al Qaeda. Al Qaeda is core. At present. Yes, correctly. And I, and I don't think they can necessarily become Al Qaeda core, Al Qaeda central, without 
very obvious moves that we're going to see and, and detect. But what, what in this region we have to be concerned about is the entire region becoming destabilized uh, by a failure in Afghanistan, by a return to civil war, by, by a great game not played by the United States, but played by those regional nations in our absence. In, in the, the, the destabilizing country of most worry, of course, is Pakistan. Our, our efforts in Afghanistan are aimed and need to be aimed as much at Pakistan and maintaining stability there as they are inside of Afghanistan. Thank you. I, I just make one comment. I think that um, it's always a bad idea to invade a country because Al Qaeda is there. Um, uh, it, it just creates many, more, many, many more problems than you solve by going in. But we have to remember how we got to where we are in Afghanistan. On the day that Kandahar fell, which was the last major Taliban stronghold, there were 100 CIA and about 400 special forces in country. We didn't actually invade Afghanistan in a large-scale fashion uh, to deal with Al Qaeda. What happened was the international community got together in the Bonn Agreement and later in the 2006 Afghanistan Compact and made a commitment to the Afghan people to stabilise the country. So I don't believe that it's a good idea to go and invade countries, as, as you quoted, um, because of al-Qaeda. I don't think that's what we did in Afghanistan. I think we're there honouring a commitment to the international community and to the Afghan people. And I think it's a valid activity for the US Congress to say, all right, how much are we prepared to spend on that? Uh, and I think what we need to do is be very careful about just escalating to success. We need to say, all right, how much are we prepared to spend? And that's, that's a sufficient amount. So I think this is a very valid activity. It's an interesting point. You know, the, uh, you know I think it was 1,000 Marines, uh, 1,300 Marines and about 1,000 Special Operations people and some airstrikes was the entire October 2001 enterprise there. And a few weeks later, Kandahar was falling. And, and so I, I'm interesting to hear your take on why it is that we remain in, in such numbers on that. And I suspect that that's probably fairly accurate. Um, I think what I take out of this, first of all, is a great appreciation for all of you for, for what you've done in terms of trying to put this together and contextualize it in testimony on that. Uh, I'm personally left with the idea that uh, there's no way out of this thing without involvement of other people. And it keeps going back to Ambassador Dobbins and, uh, you know, in his previous year, the same thing. I mean, we're not going to resolve this without Iran and India and China and Russia and the stands and Europe and, and all these others understanding that they've got to, uh, to pony up and get involved in this thing. I appreciate what you say, Dr. Cullen, about we're there because of the commitment that was made, but it certainly looks to like a lot of us that the commitment is being paid with American lives and dollars more so than some others who have probably a more immediate uh, problem there than we do on that. And I'm not sure how we're going to address that, but I think that's something that we have to address. Again, thank you all very, very much. I appreciate all the efforts that you've made of your being here again today. It's been a substantial help to all of us. Meeting adjourned. I follow you around all day. Only got about an hour and a half worth of work around here, and the rest of the time I track you like an animal. You're kidding, right? <laughs> I don't know. Am I? What? How did that get there? Come on, good news. Hey, Bambi. You okay? Leukemia. No. Oh.